Congregation, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles again to Philippians chapter 3. And I'd like to read verses 7 and 8. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Congregation, this morning we sought to lay out the marks of a fake Christian. And we said that the fake Christian is one who's putting their confidence in their flesh. And so though these people wear the label of Christian, in reality, they are frauds. They're trying to base their acceptance with God on their own privileges, maybe, their baptism or their Christian upbringing, or on their own performance, their own works, their own efforts, their own zeal, their own diligence. And yet with Paul, we concluded that if we are doing that, then we are a fake. We are not a true Christian. But that leaves us with the question then, what is a true Christian? If a Christian isn't these things, what is a Christian? And here in this thrilling passage, really this autobiography that Paul gives us, uh, we find the marks of a genuine Christian. Uh, Paul holds out for himself, holds out himself as a trophy of God's grace. Uh, Paul used to be a fake. Uh, He used to be a fraud, but God laid hold of him. God changed him. God entered his life and made a difference there. And so now he's a true Christian. And in congregation, what hope this is for you and I then? Uh, If you found yourself to be a fake, listen to Paul as he experienced the grace of God bringing him into the reality of these things. Our God is the God who takes frauds and makes them into children. So with that in mind, we want to look at our sermon. It's titled, The True Christian. And what we'll see is that there are two characteristics that distinguish the true believer. And the first characteristic is that the Christian knows that they are spiritually bankrupt in themselves. That's our first point, spiritually bankrupt in self. Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, Children, this word bankrupt, it's it's a financial word. It's a a money word. Uh, It means you're not able to pay back your debts. So you've taken on some loans, uh, maybe a mortgage for the house, some loans on a car, but if you're bankrupt, you have no money left. Uh, You can't pay back these bills. It's the opposite of being rich. It's to be poor, very poor, to declare bankruptcy. And what we're saying is that spiritually, the Christian is one who knows their own spiritual bankruptcy. They're not rich in their own eyes as they look at themselves. Uh, This is what Jesus was talking about. He says uh, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not blessed to be proud in spirit, to think you're rich, to think you have lots spiritually in yourself. No, that's that's a cursed position to be in. But it's blessed to, to be poor in spirit, to recognize our lack and to see what we don't have. Well, that's what Paul is talking about here in our, pa- our passage. And this spiritual bankruptcy, it, first of all, it begins then with a new recognition. That's the first thing, a new recognition. Notice verse 7. Paul says, But what things were gained to me. And so that's drawing us back to what he's just referred to in verses 4 through 6. Uh, there he's listed those things that once were gained to him. Uh, These spiritual assets in his life, these things that he thought made him righteous and therefore acceptable in God's sight. 
In terms of being welcomed by God, he treasured these things. They were gain to him. Uh, He loved these things. They were the fountain of his hope. Uh, He would say, I'm righteous before God. I'm welcome to stand in the presence of God because of these things. Don't take these things away from me. That was his old attitude. I need these things. This is where my gain is found. They're profiting my spiritual life. These are the things that make me rich towards God. And so Paul there, he's using that financial term. That's why we're using that imagery, because Paul uses this word gain. And Paul, he wants us to to think in terms of finances then. And so we can picture before us a, a bank statement. And so in your bank statement, you have your debits column and you have your credits column. And the debits are those things that we're paying. It's coming out of our account, and the credits are what we're receiving. It's, it's money flowing into our account. And Paul has all of these things, all of these past things that he, he treasured, they're in his credits column. And so he sees circumcision, that's making me spiritually rich. Oh, my bank account is, is inflating now. It's, it's going up. Uh, he sees his, his, the fact that he was an Israelite and, and cha-ching, more, more money in that spiritual bank account. I am wealthy towards God. Notice that's how Paul used to think. That's the point we're making here. Uh, there's a past tense that's being used. Paul says, what things were gained to me? Meaning something's changed. Paul doesn't think this any longer. There's been a new recognition. Uh, he sees reality. He sees life. He sees spiritual life in a different way now. And so it's as if, to Paul's horror, he realized that he had been reading his bank statement wrong the whole time. What he thought was his credit account, what he thought was making his, him more wealthy, he actually noticed that at the top it says, debits. These things that he thought were gaining him and, and, and improving him spiritually are actually sucking the money, the funds, right out of his account. And so what a disaster. What a disaster for Paul. In an instant, his whole world is flipped on its head. Uh, just trying to picture that with me, financially speaking. Uh, just p- put yourself there. You've worked hard. You think you're doing well. You're achieving your goals and your dreams only to find out what you think to be a million dollars in your account is actually a million dollars owed to the bank. Just think of what that would be like. That, that you look at your bank statement and you see that's the case. In an instant, everything that you thought to be true has just been smashed to pieces. Uh, hopelessness, depression, all of these things. That is but, if that happened, that would be but a small taste of what Paul experienced spiritually. Because here he came to understand That while he thought he was in good standing with God, he thought all was well, yet in reality, he was owing this massive debt to his holy God. And this debt is one that's far too great for him to pay himself. And so he's realized that he is in a great problem. He's in a great need Well, this is what Paul experienced when the Lord met him on Damascus Road. When the Lord met him there, his life was absolutely turned upside down. He went from being self-righteous to realizing he has no righteousness in himself at all. His whole world was flipped over. He thought he was strong and sturdy. His law-keeping was holding him up, and yet that was swept away like a spider's web. Because there Jesus met him. Jesus, the one who is righteous, he confronted him with his sin, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And there you could see Paul's world crumbling before him because what he was doing, it was he was zealously, he thought, upholding God's honor, and yet in that very moment, he was actually attacking the God he was seeking to impress. And friend, have you ever recognized this? As we have sought to make ourselves righteous, 
Let me just do some things for God to impress him. Have you realized that in the very act of doing that, you are attacking the God you're intending to impress? Because you're pushing aside Christ. Now, the point is not that we need to see a light from heaven or even to have a dramatic experience such as this so that we know the date on the calendar like Paul probably did. Sometimes the Lord works that way, but those things are are not necessary. What is necessary is this crucial recognition, this understanding that by nature I am a sinner and therefore everything I do is tainted by sin. And so I cannot do that which is pleasing unto this God. And so spiritually then, I'm not rich, but I'm poor, I, I'm, I'm bankrupt, I'm in massive debt to this God, and I can't get myself out. I, I've dug myself a hole, and, and if I keep just looking to my prayers or looking to my efforts, I'm digging myself deeper because those prayers are covered in sin even. And so if that's my hope, I have nothing. Do you recognize that? You must. That we are spiritually bankrupt in ourselves. Now this recognition is all about the Spirit uncovering that truth for us. Uh, The Spirit revealing our true condition to us. The Spirit showing us, turning the lights on so we can see the the vileness of, of the monster that lives inside and to show us the holiness of the God who we must deal with. This can happen suddenly like it did for Paul on the Damascus Road, or it can happen gradually in a very different way as it did for Timothy as he was brought up on his mother and grandmother's knee reading the scriptures. There's no suddenness there, and yet there's the same recognition as he gradually had this truth distilled into him and as the Spirit sweetly took Timothy, as it were, by the hand to show him these things. And so that's, That's the main issue for us then. Not how we have learned these things, not what our experience was, but that we have learned these things. That that I've begun to see my need for God's grace and for God's Christ. Well, where there is that new recognition, there's also a new reckoning. A new reckoning. That's the second thing under the first point. Notice verse 7, Paul goes on. He says, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. And that word counted is this word reckon. Uh, it's, it's a word that, that's, that means I, I've, I've determined it to be this way. I'm reckoning it this way. I'm, I'm counting it this way. In my mind, this is how I'm viewing it. And so the whole point we're making here is that Paul is no longer passive in this. Yes, the Spirit is the one who who gives us the understanding, who leads us to to recognize ourselves, to to come to that recognition. But now here is Paul, and he's responding to that. Uh, This is his active response. Paul is the one. He is the active one saying, I'm reckoning things this way. I am counting things this way. Those things that once were gained to me, I have counted them to be lost. And so here in Paul, we find this holy energy that's been stirred up. Yes, begun and worked by the Spirit, but it's as if now Paul has has taken his pen and he's moved all of his previous assets, all of those gains in his life, and he's moved them into the liabilities column. Paul is active. He is intentionally doing that. This is how Paul sees life. Those things he used to trust in, those things he counted as gain, he will trust in no longer. Notice he, he says that he counts these things as loss. As loss. Uh, they're not just simply neutral to him. But, but they're loss. They're liabilities. They're destructive. And so Paul realizes that those things he used to hope in to be righteous has become damaging for him. Now, this is not an attack on his God-given privileges in and of themselves as if they are bad in and of themselves, as if circumcision was bad in and of itself, or as if a good upbringing was bad in and of itself. No, not at all. Paul values those things. Uh, he speaks of the advantages that the Israelites had in Romans 3, the beginning, Romans 3 and Romans 9 as well. So Paul 
views these things highly. And yet Paul here recognizes that he was using all of these things to obscure his need for a full dependence on the grace of God. These good things were, were, were blocking his sight of his need. They were blinding his, his, his sight of his need, and so they were destroying his soul. Paul grew up thinking he was spiritually healthy, and so he wasn't crying out for the doctor. And it's because he was basing his, his health, his spiritual health on these things that he thought he was healthy, while in reality he was full of cancer. And so now, having seen his true need, Paul is resolute to think thoughts in line with God's thoughts. God has shown him the true nature of his own works, of his own efforts, of his own privileged upbringing. If, if he's resting on those things as his righteousness, Paul is seeing what God says and what God sees. And Paul says, I want to see life that way too. And so, congregation, is that thinking active in your life? These are the thoughts of a true Christian. Do you have the same spiritual sensitivity where you've learned to be scared of your own self-righteous tendencies? The Christian is, is, is frightened of that, where, where we can see how easy it is for us to dress ourselves up and to hope in ourselves as if that means all is well. The Christian, like Paul, has this, this anxiety to view none of these things as his righteousness. And so the Christian learns that they're spiritually bankrupt in themselves, that they have nothing to offer God. And so do you know yourself? That's the great question. Do you know yourself as God knows you, as God describes you, and as he describes me in his word, as he describes our sin, do you say, yes and amen, Lord, that is true of me? The Christian is one who recognizes these things. And so have you moved from being the proud Pharisee in Jesus' parable to the poor tax collector? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you're knowing yourself, you'll start praying like that. Lord, I need your mercy. I don't have anything to offer. You give me what I need. And so we start crying out to him, looking away from ourselves and wholly looking to God in Christ. And that takes us then to our second great principle. Yes, spiritually bankrupt in self, but second, spiritually rich in Christ. And this is the central issue. Spiritually rich in Christ. Paul has, he has just moved all of his past gains to his lost column. And the question is now, now what, Paul? Uh, what do you have if you have nothing in your gain column, if you have nothing in your credits column, if you have nothing in your assets column, what do you have, Paul? Why would you do this? And yet Paul here, he, he holds out his great purpose in doing all this. Notice verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. For Christ, that's what's motivating him. Paul is here trading away all of his, his pitiful self-righteousness for real righteousness that actually stands up in God's sight. And so children, it's like Paul is trading away all of his counterfeit money, his, his monopoly money for, for real coins and real bills. He sees that, that the gospel offers him something that is great. The gospel is is holding out this real precious pearl, this great treasure, and so he's willing to sell the trinkets that he had been clinging to. And so when he says he counted everything lost for Christ's sake, that's the secret of Paul's life. Christ is the one who's made a difference for him. Uh, he sees in Christ that there is far more there in him than what he's ever had before, and so he's willing to do this joyful exchange. Uh, notice what he says in verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. And so that's the first thing, that I might gain Christ. That's Paul's great desire. That I might gain Christ. 
This is what Paul wants most in life. That I might gain Christ. I don't care whatever else I have. That I might gain Christ. Have we learned that? Have we learned to value Christ in this way? Have we learned that he is precious? Yes, maybe I don't know him nearly as much as I want to know him. Maybe I don't see him as clearly as I want to see him. Maybe I, I, it seems like I have so little of Christ in my life. But is this the desire of your heart? That I might gain him. I want more of him. I want Jesus. This is Paul's passion. And friend, can you speak with Paul about something of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Notice what Paul says. That word excellence, it means surpassing worth. The surpassing worth of Christ Jesus. Paul's saying that nothing comes close to the value of knowing this Christ. And does your heart agree? Do, can you honestly say yes? Yes, Paul. It's true. He is precious. I've seen him in his word. He's, he's spoken to me. The shepherd has spoken to me. I've heard his voice. And I love him. I want to feast on him. I want to be filled with him. Have you seen the beloved? Does your heart pant after him? If, if you've been in a relationship, you know what it is to, to love someone, to, to, to want someone, to go after someone. And, and this is true for the Christian. They want this Christ. Not that it's always a flaming fire in their heart. Absolutely not. And yet, because that they know of the surpassing worth of Christ, they want to know him more. And so do you want to know this Jesus more? Matthew Henry says that this knowledge of Christ, it's, it's a believing, experimental acquaintance with Christ as Lord. It's an, it's an acquaintance with him. I'm not just reading about Jesus in a textbook. And, and there's no acquaintance. It's, it's just cold facts. But, but there's this acquaintance with him. It's not, as Henry goes on, it's not merely uh, something in our head, speculative knowledge, but it's a practical and a powerful knowledge of him. Do you know Christ? Is there this intimate love for him? Well, if you do, you start to speak like Paul. He's Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's mine. This Christ is no longer an abstract idea. He's, he's a person. He's not just the mediator for sinners. He's my mediator for my sins. When I see the cross, I see that he's paying for my sins there. He's Jesus, my Savior. He's my Lord. And so we respond in love and we say, yes, you're mine. Now there are times where for various reasons, the Lord might lead his children through many years to get to that point, to say, my Lord. There's a love, and yet there's confusion in their mind. And yet, what do you think of this Christ? Do you not, does your heart not go out with Paul? Don't you want him to speak more of him? My friend, you're a true Christian. Whatever you, You're a Christian. You love Christ. Your natural heart would not love Christ. It would not go out to him. This is the work of the Spirit inside you. And so Paul says, it's this personal saving knowledge that, that his life revolves around. His life no longer revolves around a religious system where he's pulling out his checkbook and making sure that okay, if I do this, then, then I'll get that. But, but now it revolves around this, this person. And so he says he has suffered the loss of all things for him. He's willing to give it all up. And Paul knows it's worth it. There's no regrets here. No, he's saying, I would do it again. I would gladly trade it all in again. I would trade in all of my righteousness as rubbish any day of the week to have this Christ. And so he wants to gain Christ. This has become the goal of Paul's life. It's the new direction in his life. 
Now, before, he didn't live this way, but now he wants him at all costs. And, and to gain Christ and to know Christ, those are really speaking of the same thing. Uh, how do we gain Christ? Well, it's by knowing him more. It's by opening his word more. It's by seeing him there. It's by, by praying to him. Yes, prayers and scripture reading are important. They're necessary. We can't live without them. But they're not the foundation of our hope. Our Christ is. And these things are, are the, the means whereby we have this Christ, whereby we have fellowship and delight in this Christ. And so, child of God, are we making it our aim to know this Christ? That's the mark of a healthy Christian. One who who wants to know him more? Or are there sins in our lives that are holding us back? What kind of sin could compare to this Christ? Won't you give it up today? Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he used to speak of preaching as, he said his task in preaching was to help people divorce themselves from sin and marry themselves to Christ. And that's, that's Paul's goal here. That every child of God would read this passage and say, what sin is in my life? I'm divorcing it. So that I might embrace my Christ who I'm married to. That I might be faithful to him. That I might walk more in his fellowship. This leads us to the second thing then, that I might be found in Christ. Not only that I might gain Christ, but that I might be found in Christ. Paul goes on in verse 9 and he says, and be found in him. This is flowing out of the previous verse. And this is what Paul wants. At the end of the day, he's looking forward to, to the judgment throne. And he's saying on that final day, I, whatever happens, I want to be found in him. This is the mission of his life. This is his greatest concern, to be found in him. And so do you notice that language? Uh, Paul does not just say he wants to be associated with Christ. He doesn't want to uh, just have Christ in his life, but he wants to be found in him. That's the Christian's hope and longing, to hide themselves in Christ. And so notice the difference. Paul before was representing himself. He was saying, Lord, look at my performance. Look at my works. I'm doing okay. Let me in. And now he's saying, Lord, don't look at me. I want to be found in Christ. Look at him. I want him representing me. I want his works standing in my place. And so I want to be found in him. I want Jesus to cover me. And Paul wants to be so connected to Christ that he's getting all of his life from Christ, just as Jesus said in John 15. He is the vine. We are the branches. I want to be found in him. I want to be engrafted into him. If, if I'm separated from him, uh, I, I shrivel up, I die, there's no life, I must be found in him. Here's my life source. This is the only way to be fruitful. This is the only way to be alive. Well, this beautiful blessing that Paul is holding out is this union of Christ, this connection to Christ. And, and this is the fountainhead then of all the blessings in the Christian's life. That, that this is what the Spirit does when, when we look to this Christ. He irreversibly unites us to this Christ. Never to be separated again. And so all of these blessings are ours forever. And notice Paul lists three of them in verses 9 through 11. First, if I am found in Christ, then I am fully justified. I am fully justified. Verse 9 not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. If I am in Christ, I'm no longer trusting in my righteousness through my law keeping, but I do have a righteousness. And it's a perfect righteousness given from God, and it's Christ. His life of law-keeping that I receive just with the empty hand of faith. That's it. I, I'm embracing his life in my place. And that means if you've looked, friend, if you've looked to this Christ, right now, present tense, you are fully justified. God the judge has declared you righteous. He's declared you to be a law-keeper in his sight. 
And this is the judge doing that. And so why, why, do, we, why do we doubt? Is God for me, child of God? Why do we doubt but when he's willing to, to give us this sure declaration, when he's given us his, his own son, that this declaration might be ours? See again the perfect robes of Christ's righteousness that, and, that surround you and know of your certain standing on that final day. If you're in Christ by faith, you are fully justified and that is our hope, our only hope for acceptance. But second, if I'm in Christ, I'm also being progressively sanctified. Paul never just stops with justification, but he always moves on to sanctification. You cannot separate these two. Uh, justification is God's declaration of the guilty sinner as righteous. Sanctification then is the life that flows out of that. The Christian response uh, worked by the Spirit. And you see this in verse 10. Paul's not just looking for a free pass into heaven, but he sincerely wants to walk with Christ. He says, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And again, this is the expression of his heart, and this is always the case. Whomever the Spirit of God has made alive, there is this desire to, to know Christ. And so notice, when Christ saves us, there's always this pursuit after him. Yes, it goes up and down, but this is the new direction of the life. The Lord places this sincere love in our hearts for this Christ. And we go after him. And we want to know him. But also we want to know his power. The power of his resurrection. And child of God, isn't that true? Isn't that your prayer? Lord, I need more of your power in my life. As I'm dealing with my sin, and it seems so strong, I can't fight it myself. Lord, give me power. Isn't that your cry? Or as you see your own fumblings in your walk of holiness and your own trippings up and, and your own cold-heartedness, aren't you crying out for power? Lord, give me power. This is the cry of a Christian. A true Christian longs for this. They see there's no power in me. The power comes from him. And here's the great comfort. The great comfort is that those who are hid in Christ they have that power. The same power that, rose, that raised Jesus from the dead is living in them because they are connected to this Christ, to the living one. And so the Holy Spirit gives them strength to pursue holiness, strength to battle with sin, even though it is a fight. But also to know the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. Isn't that amazing? Paul wants to be so closely associated with Christ, even if it means sufferings. Paul knows that if, he, if he's led into sufferings, Christ will be there. He's connected to Christ. So whatever comes his way, Christ is there with him. Jesus will be with him in the midst of that suffering, and so he is, he's content. But Paul also knows that the Lord sanctifies. He, he works this holiness so often through these sufferings. And so Paul's not seeking to, to move away from the sufferings, but he's willing to embrace them, all so that he might be led into conformity with Christ, as he says in verse 10, being conformed to his death. And that is the goal of the Christian life, to be conformed into Christ's image, that we might experience his death in us, the death to sin and the coming to life to righteousness. Well, if I am in Christ, then I am fully justified. I am f I'm being progressively sanctified. And third and finally, I will be completely glorified. Notice verse 11. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And here Paul is holding out his hope for glory. He's reminding us that he has a complete Savior in Jesus, and this is true for every Christian. And, and while we, as we read the English, it might sound like there's uncertainty here. It says, if somehow I might attain. Uh, Paul is in, not uncertain at all. Uh, there's, there's full certainty. Paul speaks elsewhere uh, with, with certainty. He says, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. 
Or Romans 8, 30 and 31, they're speaking of being justified as if it's already happened and, and then glorified, excuse me, as if it's already happened. And so when we come to Paul here, he's not speaking of uncertainty, but he's speaking pastorally. He's reminding the Philippians, he's reminding Christians that there is a struggle And it's through the pursuit of holiness. As the Christian says, by any means, I want to be holy. I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's through that pursuit, as the Spirit empowers us on that pursuit, that we will see at last, on that final day, the fulfillment of it all, the glorification. We will attain the resurrection of the dead. And so Calvin says the phrase, if by any means, does not indicate doubt, but it expresses difficulty. The Christian life is difficult. And so we must struggle against so many and so many, uh, so many and so serious hindrances, he says. But to live with him is certain. That is the certain destination for all of Christ's people. And so, child of God, think about all that the Lord has given you. In this Christ, simply through looking to this Christ, embracing this Christ. You are justified. You're being sanctified and you will be glorified. He will take you home to himself. He will set you in his presence. He will lead you home. Uh, The husband wants his bride. Christ wants his church. He wants his people. And though we often are struggling to pursue him, there's no struggle on his part. No, he draws his bride and he will bring her finally all the way home to himself. And so this is the Christian life. Paul here has shown that Jesus is glorious in every sentence. And that is the Christian life. Am I a Christian? Well, am I one who makes much of Jesus? Do I boast in the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you are a Christian, then set your mind on these great things that he has done for you so that you might love him more and live for him more fully. Won't you rejoice in the Lord with me? Amen. Let us sing out of response of something of these blessings in Psalter 204, all four stanzas titled,